Thanks to AEG for hosting us. Um, we love your facilities. They're beautiful. Um, I wanted to know where the outlet station was. Was that, uh, that, that, was that <laughs> right next door? Well, I Those forgot schools. to text you this morning and tell you to bring your outlet. Uh, oh. and, uh, you know. I looked at the financials and I thought that we had enough room for the outlet. Maybe next time. All right, so before we dive into the agenda, let's um, uh, go around the room and introduce ourselves. Uh, Terry, do you want to pick us yeah. off here? I'm Terry Tony, the Los Angeles Auditor, and I'm a member of the South of Boston State Board. Robin Beaker, the board chair. Daniel. Daniel Sabal, the Gene Enterprises, and the Vice President of the Board. Channing Jenry, with the Proper Hotel, and the uh, Secretary of the Board. Terry Rubin, South Park Big Ward, and the South Park Resident. Uh, Paul Keller, Mac Real Estate Development Board Member. Please, I'm a board member with AG. Uh, Patrick Castor, California Hospital, and the Bid Board Board Member. Kamala Slock, I'm the Director of Communications and Policy with Bid. Google and Mayor, I'm the Operations Manager for the South Park Bid Board. Katie Kiefer, Council District 14. Andrea Morgan, owner of Mercy Stone and Resident. Uh, Colin Gallery, Senior Director of Pensions. City of Bid Board, we've got a lot. Josh Krieger, Director of Real Estate Planning for the bid. And Rodolfo Santos, Common Values Coordinator. Good morning, Laura White, owner and resident at Legal Law, South Park, and also the Asian owner for the bid for the big boy. Good morning, Mike Smith, new resident and Director of International Trade for the World Trade Center, Boston. John Huntington, resident 11. Virginia Weissman, resident 11. So you love Huntington. Dave Gordon, uh, my family owns the project at Fort Hill and we're building uh, retail and apartment time. Rob Lewis, South Park Safety. Victor Urban Sided, South Park uh, Clean Team. Orlando Chandler, Captain at Central Division. Good morning, Dan, yeah, and the LAPD Central. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, we have one public comment from our friend Flash Announcement, elected announcement. Flash Announcement. Hi everyone, uh, Downtown Field Public Works Coordinator for the Council Members Office. Two event updates, one Public Works update for everyone. Event-wise, we have September 6th, the Downtown Public Safety Meeting. Uh, it's downtown-wide for residents, businesses, anybody who wants to come. Uh, the Council Member has been having uh, good conversations with Captain Brana, Chief Arcos, uh, Chief Moore, uh, so that we really reflect all of the elements that are going on in downtown and give people an open forum to openly discuss uh, what they feel, what's going on. Uh, the other item is that September 22nd, we are doing a downtown wide team up to clean up. Uh, different public works departments will be doing specific elements on that day or leading up to it, as well as different neighborhoods taking on specific initiatives within their areas. And then Public Works element, the My Figueroa project. The grand opening is August 30th, next Thursday. Um, in addition to that event, with regards to construction, by the time the grand opening happens, the project will be substantially complete. Uh, I have a long list of punch list items for the project, and I will be seeing that through, whether it's the execution of the items or throughout the next couple of months, making sure that those items work be changed, uh, further discussion, discussions need to happen. I just want to say thank you to South Park Bid for being on the ground, eyes and ears and logistics for 11th Street and the Figaro portion, uh, and we'll keep touching base on that. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Um, all right, we have one action item on the uh, agenda this morning. Um, board packets went up a couple of days ago, Eric. Uh, so. Do any board members have questions, minutes, or do I hear a motion? Who would you prefer? Second. Please. Second. Please. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so moved. So our first presenter this morning, uh, Hillary Norton from Fastlink DTLA, is running a little late. So we are going to move ahead to, to uh, item number five. And I'm really happy to welcome uh, 
Captain Orlando Chandler uh, to give a couple of updates. Um, Captain, if you could just sort of introduce yourself and your role, and then um, he's going to share a little bit about what is trending in South Park right now as it relates to the rest of downtown Los Angeles. Correct. Uh, so for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Orlando Chandler. I'm a, a fairly new captain here at Central Division. Uh, I have uh, approximately uh, 29 to 130 years for LAPD uh, in October of this year. Uh, just uh, came over to Central Division in March of the February of this year. So I'm still kind of in the know here. Um, however, I'm in charge of patrol. So I'm in, in charge of the officers, the A cars, the X cars, the basic cars that patrol the area. Uh, captain Rayner, my partner, is the Captain 3. He's in charge of, um, or he works with uh, the bids, and he works with uh, more of the community aspect of it, although I do also. Um, so he's more familiar with, um, <coughs> with, or he follows a little bit more closely the trends. He does the Facebooks and everything else. I do also, but that's uh, his primary. Um, with that said, um, I took a look at South Park's crime, and um, I'd just like to uh, present a little bit of um, the reality versus uh, perception. Perception may be that, uh, that crime is trending up as far as violent crime, but actually uh, between 2017 and 2018, your violent crime has gone down. I'll just read you some numbers here. As far as homicides, you've gone down 33.3%, uh, uh, 30, which is a change of one from uh, three to two. Um, there's uh, no change in the uh, rate one to rate two. However, the robberies have gone down 50%. In South Park, sorry, um, I'm sorry, the uh, the rate two. So the difference between rate one and rate two, uh, a rate one is uh, is uh, is uh, for sexual intercourse, and the rate two would be anything other. So the the rate one stayed the same. Uh, with three, the uh, the rate twos went down 50 percent, went from six to three. And uh, the robberies went down 2.8%. They went from 36 to 35. And uh, the biggest decrease that we have here in South Park are aggravated assaults, which would be like assault with a dead, dead weapons, felony batteries, that went down 10%. What we struggle here uh, with in South Park uh, tend to be the property crime. However, um, even with the property crimes, your, your biggest uh, issue in South Park would be uh, burglary and theft of motor vehicles. And uh, I'll explain that just a little bit. Burglary and theft motor vehicle, or when, obviously when uh, someone breaks into a car, usually it's, it's a parked vehicle. Uh, either the door is unlocked, the door is unlocked and someone can get in, it's a theft. If they have to break something to enter, then it's gonna be a burglary from motor vehicle. Um, one of the issues that we have here in South Park, especially with all the venues and everything, is uh, some people, they choose not to park in secure parking. They'll go into off streets. We have an entertainment detail that, that actually patrols this area but we can't prevent people from parking where they want to park. And if they choose to park on the streets where you know the lighting's not great or anything like that, we try to give it extra patrol. However, those are targeted locations by um, people that want to do those type of crimes. So uh, what we've done, we put up pole cameras. There's a pole camera uh, where the people in Hope. Uh, we have pole cameras uh, in uh, areas just adjacent. Um, we also have uh, uh, motors. When we ever have a, um, and and excess of resources, we bring them over to South Park, especially when it's motor, and they'll go and they'll patrol up and down and they'll do traffic enforcement. So we try to address uh, those issues that way. We also have what we call missions at, uh, at Central Stage and actually on LAPD. So all of our missions, we try to address the property crime, especially here in South Park. And what that means is that officers in roll call, they're given sheets that says that when they have any free time or going to and from calls, we want them to all these particular areas, and South Park is in those missions. We also have what we call cred poll, which is predictive policing. So what we do, there's some algorithms that, that are used to determine, or try to determine where the next crime is gonna occur. We give that information to the officers, and in between calls, we have them go and patrol these areas. So for instance, if we know there's gonna be events at, at Staples Center, not only do we have the entertainment detail that's here, that's usually, let me give you the numbers on that, we have a supervisor and 11 officers uh, that will come and work uh, the entertainment area or somewhere in South Park. But uh, not only do we do that, we have officers that would actually, as a mission or as a prep code mission, also augment that detail to um, make sure that, um, that we're seen and that we're visible. 
Does it always work? No. But I can tell you this, your um, burden of motor vehicles only went up 18%. I'd say only that's high. However, compared to the rest of uh, Central Division, on average, it's gone up 34%. So we are putting um, <coughs> we are putting units in this area, and we're trying to drive down crime. One of the issues that we have, we have over 400 officers. We're the biggest man in the city. Um, but we also have the, the biggest uh, homeless population in the city also. So we have a lot of details. We have Reset, which uh, deals with uh, homeless issues uh, and what we call the box or skip row area. Um, that has pushed out to the west side or, or south part uh, area. And so we have Hope Details, which are um, the uh, homeless outreach programs. And then we also have uh, LASA, which is also a homeless outreach program. So we do this uh, throughout Central Division, but we do concentrate a lot of resources here uh, in the South Park area to reduce crime. So again, the perception may be, uh, you know, if you're the victim of crime, that's all that matters to, to most people, so they feel that crime is rampant. However, the reality is that crime is down in South Park area, violent crime. Uh, between 2017 and 2018. However, property crime is up a little bit, but we are working on that. Any questions? I've got a question. Yes. What is the circumference of the Central Division? Where does it run from? Uh, Central Division. You gotta tell me, uh, Danny. I mean, I know the area, it goes from uh, the border of uh, Elysian Park. Um, it will go all the way to Washington. Washington. Yes. And then we go a little bit past uh, the freeway here. And then we go all the way down to Alameda. Yeah, Santa Fe is on the arch as well. Yeah, it's the yeah. arch here. So basically, what is it, about five square miles? I think about six point something. Right. But, but, but basically, I, I'm slow for this area. We just, if I may, let me sit down for a second. Um, my area is south of 7th Street, north of Washington, west of the hill to the freeway. Okay. We're, it's growing like crazy. You guys, you have developers here, I heard me, but you know, themselves. We have a bad, we have a really, our problem is horrible right now for a from motor vehicle. And here's why. I say on average we have 10 a week, okay? Out of the 9 out of 10, they're not residents. They're people uh, coming here from the venue. They're going to park cheaply or they're just going to find a place to park. Now they have to pay $500 for the deductible, right? <laughs> when they go get their stuff. They're leaving electronics on the front seats, guys. They're leaving the Louis Vuitton purses. They're, they're leaving property in plain view. And that's what we're trying to emphasize on, on social media, Instagram, everything I have to do, you lock and hide and keep it. We talk all the time about the parking structures here. For all the venues, we don't have a problem here. It's it's hope, all the people, all over. And so what, nine of the 10 are windows matching, nine out of 10 are electronics, one of the 10 was unlocked car, but again, they're not residents. They're basically parked on the streets. Um, very rarely do residents do get um, their cars get broken into. How, however, like that Luma and Evo and all them, your parking structure is not secure, okay? Just because you have a gate, don't think it's secure. It's not. So please lock your cars and please hide your belongings. And that's all. Does anyone have any questions? Because the reason why I'm saying this is, <laughs> here's why you know why, you know why, you know why, I'm very passionate about you know why, we're getting annihilated and our numbers are not, are, to me, our numbers can be fits if people just put their stuff away. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize. You know, the people need to put their stuff away. So I'm not trying to yell at you guys, but that's what I say. I'm not assuming anything. I, I read these reports every and every Tuesday this captain sits down with all the detectives, lieutenants, senior lead officers, and we sit down we, and we look at all the crime numbers. We look at um, not the numbers he gave me earlier. And so, and I talk to Francis at Luma, and, I, and I'm there all the time, guys. And I, and I listen to people. Your, your gates close, I, I Millicent. Oh, I know that, I know that. And so I try to do everything I can to, to do some sort of prevention and, and, and explain stuff, but people don't want to spend new money. That's the bottom line. And, and I can tell you in detail because I read pretty much every report that, that comes through exactly how these burglary promote vehicles happen. <coughs> They're using uh, these bar club chips. And sometimes they just match the window, but it's always, or most of the time, nine out of 10, it's gonna be things that are in plain sight. So, um, and, and part of the issue is that there's very little follow-up on burglary promoter vehicles in, in this particular area because 
the, and I'm trying to use this word properly, but the victims are transient in the sense that they don't live in this area. So they come in, they don't check the websites, they don't check anything, they don't look for a lock it, hide, keep it, and they come in, they're unaware, they become a victim, and then they leave. They're not gonna come back for any kind of follow-up. If they leave, they're not coming back for us to take prints. So we can't send someone to Huntington Park to take prints. And so those crimes sometimes become, or, or stay unsolved. So uh, it's an issue when you have uh, transient victims that don't live or work in the area. We can't really do the follow-up that's necessary in order to put someone in jail. Say we find someone, or we do make arrests for murder from motor vehicle. Maybe we have only time to one or two burglary from motor vehicles. However, if our victims weren't transient, we could tie them to more and, and uh, put them away for a longer time or at least give the evidence uh, to the uh, city attorney or district attorney so that they can uh, have a better prosecution. So it's very difficult. That's why we need to get the word out. And the easiest thing to do is, like Danny said, just don't leave things in plain sight. That is it, nine out of 10, maybe even more than that. It's plain sight. Yes. If um, if someone were to ask um, how many officers were in Central Division, say five years ago, how would how would you find that out? Um, so I mentioned four hundred today. I'm just yes. curious, how many were in the division five years ago? I have to do some research on that. And we do know there's Wait, more. I think it's the same number. So even though the number is growing, and our captain is working very diligently, we're, we're going to be getting, I don't know, about 30, 40 new officers in the first of the year? Right, somewhere so, around So here. the 440 is going up the first of the year? Correct. Correct, it is. That, I can say that. But we're excuse me, the 400 is going yeah, up. Yeah, don't say don't say 440. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <so, laughs> I misspoke. The 400 <laughs> is going up in January to some new number. It should be going up because it's greater than 400. Correct, that is correct. But we're also getting more of an area, so it may not affect South Park in, in, that, in the way you may think, because those resources may be dedicated to the area that we're getting from Newton. Paul, I do want to just add because quickly that we that there's a, a new, so uh, Deputy Chief Arcos has, is now um, has been promoted, and so we have a new Deputy Chief for Central Division, and I had the pleasure of meeting with her uh, last week, and for this week. Um, uh, so myself and the other bid directors from downtown really made this case of, look, and, and we continue to do this, we've been doing this for a long time, but, you know, with all of the development that's happening and all of these new people that are coming to town, we really need some more support from the community. And it doesn't mean taking resources away from other divisions and relocating them here, which is sort of what's been going on in the past. It means uh, increasing recruits, essentially. We um, always, I'm sorry. No, no. We always ask for more officers. I'm just telling you, we do it every single time that we have an opportunity. We ask for more officers. However, you have to understand uh, the chief of police point of view. The chief of police will look at this report and he'll say, you're down as far as South Park. He'll look at all the central, not just South Park. And he'll say, you're down in a certain number of crimes. But then when he looks at a different division, let's say at Southeast, he sees they're up. Hard, really hard for him to justify to give us more officers when we're trending the right way. So I'm not saying we have to let crime up because we would never do, go up, but because we would never do that. But we have to come up with better strategies than we have been as far as uh, trying to uh, handle the property crime in this area. And we are positively affecting violent crime. So I think it's working. You have to be patient. We're, we're gonna continue to try. And if there's any new ideas, then we'll be happy to take a look at it and try to implement it. Have you been able to recognize any particular patterns uh, certain days of the week or when we have an event you know, at uh, Staples at certain neighborhoods or you can get part of in other areas? Uh, whenever there's an event uh, in this area, then our burglary for motor vehicles tend to uh, go up a little bit, but we deploy for that. Are we aware on the, um, the VIE side with our local, um, like the security patrol guys right around, are they coordinating with you on that? So on those particular days yes. that they can shift their resources? So the first Thursday yes. of the month, yep. LA Live Staples has a campus meeting and we get the, the agenda of the following month. Okay. And good example, on Saturday, they caught a burger from one of vehicle suspect for a South Park visit. Thank you guys. So one did just get arrested on Olympic and, and Olive. And we may tie him into some other ones at 808 and Olive as well. 
Um, there have been a couple other arrests, but you know, I'm not going to sit here and discuss politics, but Prop 47 versus as well, like we all know that, so we'll just let that one die. Um, to answer your question too, sir, next month, okay, we have a new chief of police, okay, he's cleaning house. Next month, every division is going to a lot of officers. So I, I don't know if yeah. I want to discuss that, but because there I don't, more. Because what happens is, I mean, I know that's coming, but I just don't know the number. I don't want to get your hopes up and tell you that's a certain number and then make the determination that that's not what we're getting. What it is is we have what we call managed attrition. So what they're trying to do, and the chief has been really, he's done it once already since, uh, since he became chief. But what he's doing, he's looking at all the administrative jobs that are inside the building or that are uh, administrative in other divisions and other areas. And he's trying to determine if in fact those positions are absolutely necessary. If in fact they're not necessary, he's gonna send them off to geographical divisions, which will go ahead and backfill for patrol. So we have 400 right now. We anticipate, we anticipate that increasing in the next two DPs. I just don't know how much. It could be one, it could be 20. I just don't know. So I can't really you know, speak to that. However, it is coming. But I do know that, that um, that we are that we, we will be getting more officers uh, when we acquire those new reporting districts. So I know that's coming. I don't know what the final number is. I think it's somewhere around there. I mean, I think you just need to know because we're not dealing with the present. We're dealing with the future. Yeah. We're anticipating another twenty thousand people living here in the CBD by twenty twenty. So in. No, what do you think about that? that? Our department, seriously, the city of Los Angeles would never abandon you here, sir. I mean, this place. Well, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm no, not but what I'm saying is that they are doing surveys and they are they are increasing. That's what Cap's trying to say, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be okay. locked down on something. He doesn't, you know, no, I understand. I'll, I'll be locked down on something, I'm telling you. The appointment <laughs> period, the first, the deep needed, deep needed appointment. That's why people like me, because I tell you like it is. The appointment <laughs> period is a 28 day month. We go on a 13 day, a 13 month calendar, okay? I don't know how that works. I thought it was 12 months, but we LED called the appointment period. So he said the word DP needs appointment period. It's every 28 days. Uh -huh. So 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 when he was talking about the next two months, basically, we're gonna be getting more bodies. And and, and we're gonna But it sounds like your your area is also expanding. Yeah. But no, okay, um, January one, that's the possible date that we're getting the, um, a little bit more of the arch station. We're getting the ground bus station in new division, okay? We're picking up some of the, the new um, east side. It's it's residential, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, it's probably more beneficial to the community that Central has that not community has, right. if that makes sense. So long story short, trust me, downtown LA is number priority. I mean, one. the metric to burn into your brain, which is what we've had to do, is 2020, 100,000 people. 2020, 100,000 people living in the CBD. It's pretty remarkable. It well, is. just from 2013, you had 25,000, you're almost at 60 plus. We're so I did it yeah. in five years. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So, okay. so, so trust me, I, sir, I study this all the time. Yeah. I'm very analytical guy. Okay. So, so I get what you're saying. So, it, it, but I'm telling you, our department, they, they look, they do surveys. They, they find out what's going on. We see it growing. We, we get from the council district, the, the voters registration. We see how, how large this, this community is growing. It's growing so quickly. It, it, it's like right now we're in growing pains and we get it. So patience, patience, and we're gonna work it this out. Clean and safe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just have one question for you guys. And, and as you know, we're inundated with illegal vendors here in and around the campus. A couple weeks ago, you guys were very helpful with us to help move them out and cite them. Can we, can we, Continue to see that? Is that just hit me? Yes. Um, the entertainment detail and I, we're going to do the health, go back to the health department thing. And so, just how it works, guys, we're going to work with LA County Health. Um, last two weeks ago, Sergeant Alamir, when he was here, he was videotaping roaches on hot dogs. I don't know if you saw that. We, yeah, we, have the, we sent those photos to the mayor's office, by the way. Well, wonderful. Okay, so so <laughs> along with the other fires that are caused by right. the illegal propane things. And so we're working with the health department. However, we're just trying to get a certain dates and we're trying to do a few, like, we want to do a double tap, like hit them on a Friday and hit them on a Saturday, not just this once type of uh, enforcement. And this um, type of enforcement, it's, it's a, uh, it takes an effort. It's, a, it's, it's an effort that, that has to be um, uh, organized and coordinated. It's not something that the police can just do by themselves. 
So when you talk about working with the health department, if you don't work with the health department on this, it's done. They're going to be back. So we have to do that in order to get um, to have some positive. Well, they're starting to put juveniles behind the carts now in order to hope that you move on. So we did this task force in the rain, uh, Officer Jamil, uh, Linda Jones, and myself with the health department. We got like 18 bodies. And, and now then what they do is they bring their children to when we're signing up, every place in the world yells at us. It calls us everything, you know, to we're horrible human beings, I'm a, a bad, bad person, I'm Donald Trump. You know, <laughs> they say everything because they, 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 they don't understand. You, guys, you know how they thaw the hot, the hot dogs out? In the bathtub of water, okay? You know how they thaw their carne asada and their chicken on a car tarp in the front lawn squirting down the hose. Okay, you can cook that food on the sun, and you're not going to get rid of botulism or salmonella. It's already embedded in the meat. So when people want to complain, oh my God, I have the hot dog at Staples, I'm sick. No, you need that nonsense on the street to like, make you sick. So we get it, and we're doing everything we can. The problem is we're dealing with another entity. It's not a problem, it's more of a challenge, and it's their time and our time. That's what we're trying to do. It's, 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 so let us know if we can help you, because as you know, we video. You know, our goal. I also was yeah. going to bring KCAL 9 Rachel Kim here to interview you guys, and that one blew up, but nobody really wanted to pursue that. And I think that would have been really worthy, because people need to see how dangerous those carts are. I mean, that cart blew up, and then you had another one catch on fire two right. weeks ago. Right. So uh, if you can just now hosted though, wasn't it posted on? But no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't need it happen, but. But, but, the, but the thing is, is that um, it, it, these, are, these are walking, I mean, you wouldn't talk about bombs. These are walking bombs. And then now what they do is they, they block the uh, pathways. So now they block people where, you, if, if there's an emergency, you can't get out of this, this place because they block, it's nonsense. I know, we're gonna continue, <laughs> we're gonna continue to inundate the mayor's office with video and photos. Not so hope, that, hope that, hope that they take action quickly. Thank you so much. This was a great update. Um, I have uh, I have the captain's contact information, so if anybody has follow-up questions, I can definitely. I'm leaving the park here also. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I saw we do have one other public comment. Um, Shiraz joined us a few minutes late, uh, so he's just going to take a minute and give a quick update as far as public comment. Thanks, Alan. Um, sorry to be late, folks, and um, I'll keep it brief. Um, Shiraz Tangri, um, one of my gigs downtown is uh, working on the Downtown Streetcar Project, uh, which has been recently in the news, and so I wanted to uh, come here and just kind of let folks know where things are. I, I would say the, the kind of quick line is um, there's some news, but none of it is new. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, the project itself has not changed. The path that we're on is really the same path we've been on now for about seven plus years. Uh, in terms of where it's going to go, what it's going to look like, um, and, and you know how do we get there? What we've been waiting on for a couple of years um, is, is what the news is about. Um, one of the key pieces that we've been waiting for is for the Federal uh, Transit Administration to allow us to move forward with federal environmental review. You may recall two years ago we did our EIR that went through the City Council. Um, this was the California Environmental Quality Process and the City Council certified our EIR back in 2016. But because we're looking for federal funds, we had to do essentially a parallel process um, under the federal version, which is called the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. So that process is just concluding. I think our comment period may have closed on uh, Tuesday. And um, we have by and large received the type of comments we expected. They were, we received a lot of supportive comments. Um, the other things are issues that we think we anticipated and, and we'll be able to deal with. So that's good news. We've heard positive um, signs from the FTA that they will move our project forward um, this year, which is great. The other great thing that happened um, in council just last week was that the city council blessed our ability to go forward with a financing plan for the project. Um, and this is something, again, we've been waiting on for a couple of years because there's some key pieces of financing that we needed to, to be able to lock down. So the next steps for the project really are, we're gonna complete that environmental review and then the city is gonna be applying to Metro to accelerate the $200 million that was in dedicated for the project in Measure M, but we were sort of the last project in Measure M that those dollars are allocated to not make it to us until 2053. And we're gonna ask Metro to move those dollars up now because the project is otherwise shovel ready. We have our EIR done. We'll have our federal review done shortly. We think we have the other pieces in place as well. Um, we're gonna be looking for that federal funding to come in as well. So 
I would say watch the space. Um, we'll coordinate with Ellen. I think now that we those pieces have sort of fallen into place, we want to get back out in front of downtown, let them know what's happened with the project. As I think we all know, there's a lot of people here um, who are new and maybe weren't here when we were much more actively engaged with the, with the public um, over the last several years. So we're going to do some events and things to try and get people kind of up to speed uh, in the next couple months and, and hope that we can make the push to you know, really get the project uh, on track for, for construction in the next couple of years. So, thanks, thanks Jeff. All right, uh, let's move right along. Hillary has joined us, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Um, and there's a clicker somewhere, I think. Yeah. Okay. Hillary, you've got um, like 10 minutes. I'm okay, sorry, okay. but I got to keep No it problem. Tight. So I'm going to um, run, like literally run, but I'm also going to run through these slides quickly because you guys definitely get this all, but I, I really want to make sure that um, that you have a sense of what we're doing with Fastlane DTLA. And in a word, we are creating a transportation management organization and also creating a microtransit program. And microtransit is um, six passengers and a professional driver. So we have, we're going to have vehicles that are going to be well marked and they're going to be on demand, but you're going to be able to use them to replace some services that really haven't been here before and, and also to meet the needs of people who are used to taking Dash and, and haven't been able to do that in the evenings. So quickly, so, and, and as you said, we've, we've gone, the increase in population is so staggering, we've got to do something about this. We need to reduce the number of cars and it is so confusing. The reason I was late is because the ways didn't have that 11th is closed, the, the parking lots are closed. I mean, people are saying, we're not doing this anymore. We're not driving in. It's a disaster. We want to give people a reason to come into downtown and, and appreciate it for what it is without feeling like frustrated and stuff. But here's the problem. 70% of Angelinos don't take transit. So what can we do to encourage people to come here, take transit, and to start using something differently? So we're going to change the mobility culture. We are going to have new micro transit services, an on-demand travel app. And the reason this is important is because you absolutely have to have real wayfinding. And I'll go into that after it. We're going to be doing events. We're going to be a one-stop shop. So when you have a business that's going in, when you have projects that are happening, we're going to help you entitle that by addressing the mobility issues instead of working your way through it and trying to address it on every single site. And we're going to be providing low income uh, discount travel prices and group rate passes. And that for residents and employees, but not just employees, 1099 workers. And for those of us who are independent contractors who've been locked out of all the employee subsidies, those days are over. We're going to be working on this a lot with Metro. It is hugely important. So we have a huge community of people who want to work with us. And so we're going to be mobilizing that half a million weekday commuters, 50,000 tourists each day, let alone the huge population growth. 125,000 people by 2040, 70,000 housing units, and 55,000 jobs. I remind people, this is about the size of Pasadena. So we're going to be adding Pasadena in the next uh, 22 years, just within downtown. That, that is also 20% of the entire growth of the city of Los Angeles is going to happen in downtown LA. What did you say? Your math is small. Yeah, it's way more than 125. No, no, they're adding 125,000 people. That is the planning department. So those numbers are correct, sir, and I made sure you check them. But thank you, Paul. It's always helpful to get your corrections. Um, so, we're also going to be rebranding downtown Los Angeles as a mobility center, adding in tech, because everybody knows that in order for tech to come to a downtown area, you need to have two things. You need to have high-tech mobility, and very often you need to have streetcars. So it's very important that we have things like the streetcars, because Portland, Seattle, those communities brought tech and millennials because streetcars bring people and they can go easily on their iPhones and not look up. 
So we're going to be doing some things that are going to be exciting. So you can stay on your iPhones. You can um, not look up, but you can actually start walking around, shopping where you need to, and getting where you need to instead of being stuck on the roads and not going to your businesses and enjoying what it would be like to live in your buildings. So if we can get just 3% of people who are in those cars to do something different, we can change the traffic on the streets. So um, we are going to have a big mobility network. We'll go through this later, but we don't have time. So um, <laughs> we want to talk about what this mobility network is. Flex LA is the brand, and that's going to be our microtransit. Those are the vehicles, but it's also the app. The app is going to be um, out at the end of September, but one of the reasons that I'm here is because you guys are so tech savvy and you're the coolest people in downtown. So we want to have you as part of our beta testers of the app. It's going to be really fun. And um, this app is going to be this um, multimodal app. And I'll show you why it's going to be different. Our fleet is going to be Mercedes vehicles. So it's the flex vans. It's also going to be the, um, the GLC hybrids. They are going to be driven by US veterans paid full time. So these are people who have a full time wage who are going to know downtown, who know how to take care of people and have um, cop vision, which is really important because when you have people walking through the streets um, who don't care about whether they're walking at your moving car or crossing illegally, you need to have people who understand what it's like to be in um, high stress areas in and around downtown. And let me just tell you, a lot of the U.S. veterans who've been working for Lyft and Uber and are not making any money at all are delighted to be here to serve you because they love downtown. It's the high adrenaline place to be, but they would just like to be paid a little more. So thank you for what your business is going to be. So uh, bike share, car share, ride share, and uh, our partner ecosystem is Movil, who is currently doing the LA Mobile app. When you can pay, instead of using a tap card, that app exists. And we already have a great relationship with LADOT. Me, FAST, I'm the executive director of Fixing Angelino Stuck in Traffic, the LA Clean Tech Incubator, and a company called Butterfly that runs fleet management and also um, wheelchair accessible vehicles because we will have wheelchair accessible vehicles as well. Here's what our app is going to look like. We have kiosks that are going to be with the LA Clean Tech Incubator but can be in any of your lobbies so people can access this without having to have their iPhones. Um, it's a great tourism opportunity. Um, the mobility and wayfinding, they're going to be, you, you pick where your destination is and we're going to show you how you can get there by any kind and any combination of transit and as well call us up. So we also are going to have our own branded tap card. So we'd like to work with your businesses to start recognizing that tap card. So it's going to be seen as being cool to take transit and you're going to have, you know, just like uh, Grand Central Market and other places, you can get $2 off because people, we want to get more customers in without having to make room for their cars. Um, our app is going to be in Spanish and English. We are going to have um, app-based trip payment, so you don't always have to pay every time with a virtual wallet. And we're going to have a number of different options to look at about how to do this microtransit. We're going to have a single flat rate fare. It is not going to have surge <coughs> pricing, which is another big bonus. And. Uh, so with this app and the rider app and an operator dashboard, we're going to be able to get back to you as to how people are actually moving. And so when you're trying to entitle new projects, instead of going out and having people say, no one's going to do that, no one's going to walk, no one's going to take transit, we're going to be able to give you third party validation information for your buildings and for the community <coughs> for what's actually happening, which isn't happening now. So. Um, what we love about this app is that instead of having just a two-dimensional screen, you're going to have a picture of where those virtual stops are. So we want to work with you about creating your spaces as those virtual stops so people will see a picture day and night of where to wait. And we would like to work with you to find places so people can walk to them. And because these are nimble, agile vehicles, where could we stop that's not necessarily on the street? Do you want us to stop right in front of your building? Do you have a driveway or a port of share that we could be part of that can help you pick people up and not make it so confusing? We'd love to do that. And by identifying these virtual stops, you don't have drivers get lost, which is what's always happening when you're trying to use Lyft and Uber. Um, so we have a pretty huge service area. We're going to be operating with a fleet that is going to be growing based on demand. 
So we're excited to show you how that growth is gonna occur. We have a data-driven approach. And so <clears throat> lastly, the LA Mobile app, you can use it right now. It is a basically a virtual tap card for your Dash route. So we're already <coughs> working on how to make this easy payment so people aren't fumbling around for wallets so that there aren't potentially victims of crime on the street. <coughs> and um, so you know what the benefits are to development and existing development, but this will always be ready for you. Ellen's gonna have this presentation. Shared mobility combats loneliness and contributes to the vibrant exchange of ideas. This is a huge issue for millennials. They want to travel together, they want to do stuff together, they just don't know how to talk to each other, so they just want to be, I'm a parent of millennials, so I know. Um, so they want to be near each other, and if we can start moving together differently, if we can actually create a culture where we're starting to look out for each other, travel together, have this multi-generational space in which it's not just about the sidewalks, but it's how we move, how we interact, and we, it, link it up with all of the transit investment that I skipped over because we didn't have enough time, it's going to be really exciting. And so we want you to help change downtown LA by joining this coalition. And we're thankful that, that Ellen Rio is actually one of the people on our board. And what we would like is participating as beta testers. We want you to be part of the on-demand survey. We want you to help identify virtual stops you would like to see. We want to partner with those business discounts. We are working with the council office to tell on this Bright Miles program because we're tired of there being no street lights in downtown that work. And so we want to have, with the council office, they already agree they're doing a whole rewiring of the street lights so we don't have people stealing out the copper anymore. And um, so that we can have safe places for people to wait for transit at night. But we want to work with the kids because we want to make this safe, defensible space and we want to actually contribute to where you want to be driving people because you have the vision. And uh, together we want to build a comprehensive plan for walking, biking, and transit stations. And that's that. Wow. Okay. So this is wonderful and, and thank you for that. Uh, this looks very well thought out. A couple of questions. Um, how many of the cars do you guys anticipate having or at least starting with? And what does the pricing look like versus say Uber? We're starting with um, 12 of these vehicles, but that's day one. When, as, soon, as soon as you guys download the app and you show us how many rides you want, then Mercedes is gonna go, oh my gosh, we got this much. They, they have the ability to ramp up. So that's one thing. Um, the, the price is $6. And I'm gonna tell you, I took Lyft in the middle of the day, four blocks, and it was $5.80. So $6 flat rate, anytime is um, very competitive. And for low income, it's $2. What's the radius of it? What's this? It, that entire map. So it's on demand. Six dollars within that downtown radius. So taking people to and from transit, it, it's a, it's an ability to park once and get anywhere. Um, and we're working with LADOT because our, we want to show them where the real demand is for real transit too. Because we want to start having not only our stuff but. This, this is where the dash route should be going, or creating new ones. So, Tony, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I will. So, I'm on the board of Fastlane DTLA, mm -hmm. and I will be sure to keep this organization apprised as to mm -hmm. how this progresses. I know that there's some big milestones coming mm -hmm. up, so we're really excited. Um, I'll share the information about beta testing the app as soon as it's available. Yep. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, again, um, Hillary's info is there. I have to keep the meeting moving, sure. so. Uh, thank you again, Hillary. And I'll be in the back of the room with my cards if you want to talk to me early about beta testing and other things. So, um, and this presentation is really huge, but I can truncate it and give you any components of it whenever you'd like. Fantastic. Thanks again thank you so, so much. Soon. All right, so moving on to item number six, we have a really, um, uh, I think, fascinating look at what's going on in the retail world, particularly as it relates to uh, South Park. Um, this is sort of, uh, born out of us recognizing um, the consistent narrative that we're hearing over and over again about sort of the death of retail uh, and how retail is going to survive given online retail's popularity. Um, Josh put together this fantastic deck, and Josh, you've got this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to fly through this stuff. Um, I can talk 
forever on a lot more detail. So if people have specific questions, please talk to me after or give me a call after. I'm happy to do that. I want to start out with um, just some background on the retail sort of market in general um, across the country. Many of you probably have heard this um, phrase, retail apocalypse. Um, that's basically referring to the last four or five years. Um, retail has been in this huge sort of state of change. Um, this tough to see, but this is over the last three years, all the national brands that have gone bankrupt. Um, so large number of, of brands. Um, and last year, 2017, was actually the worst year for retail in general um, in decades. So the industry is going through a lot of change. Um, a lot of that has to do with e-commerce. There's a lot of other issues. Um, one of them is this chart down here, which I apologize for people probably not being able to see, but basic point here, this is um, the gross leasable area per capita in some of these Western countries. So the US has 23 square feet of retail space per capita. Canada has 16. All these Western countries, UK, France, Spain, um, Italy have two, three, four um, square feet. So we have like eight to 10 times the amount of retail space per person in the US compared to those other Western countries. Basic point is, we've been building way too much retail space over the last two, three decades um, than we need. So now we have this oversupply of retail space combined with all the changes happening with e-commerce and, and other um, factors um, mean that there's a lot um, of oversupply. Just put this chart in. Um, this is uh, the Soho uh, district in New York, which many of you might be familiar with. Very high-end retail area, a lot of uh, boutique clothing, a lot of like flagship um, kind of high-end stores um, have gone in the last 10, 15 years. These red spots here are all the vacancies currently in that district. If you do like a Google search, Soho uh, retail vacancies, a whole bunch of articles will come up, basically trying to explain how this otherwise thriving district could have all these vacancies that are, seem to be persistent. I was gonna kind of go into an explanation of some of that and why, how that might relate to downtown LA. I don't have time for that. Um, but the basic point is that you know, there's a lot of different idiosyncrasies in retail real estate, and a lot of times it's much more complicated than just the simple you know, demand versus supply um, that can affect having vacancies. Um, and also this chart here, basically the types of retail that are doing well and doing poorly um, the last three, four years. Um, so these top ones here, are dollar store, convenience store, or drug, liquor store. This also is sort of a backdrop that kind of creates challenges um, because it's the type of stores, discount stores, convenience stores, dollar stores that are really doing well in this environment, you know, are not necessarily the type of stores that we've been focused on trying to um, recruit the South Park. Um, and then the last kind of background, which I think people pretty much know if you've been in LA um, for a while, but it's a little bit stark when you look at the map. This is uh, median income by census tract for the LA region. Obviously, we're this dot right here in the middle. The darker blue is the higher income areas. So we're surrounded by essentially the lowest income areas in the region. Why this matters is because although our demographics stack up really well to compare like us to say Santa Monica or West Hollywood or Glendale Burbank, what retailers know and what they, their sort of frame um, since they've been in the business is these areas have lots of wealthy areas around them and people shop there from you know three miles, five miles away. And so when you're trying to convince them to come downtown, they're very well aware of like, hey, it's downtown is surrounded by these you know, much lower income areas. And so trying to get them to, to shift their frame um, and focus a lot on the growth that's happening here, there's a variety of ways to try to sort of make that case. Um, but I just wanted people to kind of be aware of that. Like, I, I think what we try to do is focus people on the sort of the metrics where we show very well, but there is sort of that um, headwind that we're going against um, and trying to recruit people to not that. This is kind of an overview on where we are in South Park in, um, in specific. So we have 41 projects that are currently in the pipeline um, that have retail space. That's things under construction and um, in entitlement that haven't started construction. That's gonna add about 800,000 square feet of new retail space. Since January 2016, so basically the last year and a half, we've added 93,000 square feet of new retail space. These two numbers, I think, are key to understand. So of that 93,000, 67% of that is now leased. Um, but if 
you walk around the district, only 17% of that is actually occupied right now. So I kind of wanted to explain this dynamic because I think if you just walk around the district, you see a lot of spaces that are empty and have a broker sign in it. And it gives the impression that you know, there's very little retail in the district. Actually, a lot of that space is already spoken for. Um, most of that has been leased. A lot of the, the stuff that either um, hasn't been leased and very close to being leased has a lot of interest in it. Um, but it just it takes a really long time for a lot of these things to get all their permitting, to build out the space. For, just to give some examples, Frank took about two and a half years from when they submitted their LOI to when they actually opened first draft, um, which is opening soon at Wren, also took you know close to two years. Um, so particularly restaurants, if you have to build out a kitchen space, it takes a long time, depending on the permitting. Um, so I know it's frustrating for people in the district to, you know, they want the new retail to open and, you know, it's taken a while. Um, but I think if you look at this number, so this is all the retail in the district, so everything that's existing, um, including that new space, 87% of the space is leased. Um, and so typically if you have, you know, a mature retail corridor that's doing well, you'd like to see that number around 95%. Um, we're not a mature retail market. We're basically starting from zero. Um, so given the drastic change in the neighborhood, I think um, we're doing fairly well. And I'll get to in a second. I think we're about to hit sort of a, a tipping point um, in terms of retail and, and interest. I'll skip through this, but this is just a lot of the brands that are either in the district or right around um, the district. Key point on this is a lot of these brands are people that you know, I've toured through the district. A lot of them that ended up going around like A Street or Whole Foods or by the block really like the demographics in the district. In the last couple of years, a sort of repeating refrain that I've heard is that we want to be in South Park in two years or in three years. And they basically have been waiting for more of the projects to be completed, more people to move in. Um, but it's very rare that I hear anybody that you know is not really interested in, at some point in being in South Park. It's really been a timing issue um, to this point. This is a really key graph, and um, so this is the timeline for completion of new residential, re residential units. So everything that's in the pipeline so far for the next four years, we're currently at about 10,000 um, residents in, within the district. This next um, year, basically, we're going to have a number of projects completed, um, and then we're going to get to this point around Q3 of next year, where we're going to have this stretch of probably a year and a half, two years, where we're gonna have a pretty steady um, population. We're not gonna have a lot of construction in kind of the core residential part of the, the district, so like around Hope, Grand. Um, we'll still have some construction on the outside. But I think this is really gonna be the tipping point where we're gonna be around 15,000 people right within that district. Um, because it, one of the things that's hampered some of the retail expansion on Hope Street, um, where we've kind of got a cluster of businesses, um, but there's been so much construction around there with my fig, with um, some of the projects on the, the south end um, around 12th Street, that it's really kind of hammered a lot of those small businesses there. And it's been difficult in touring some of the smaller businesses that are interested in the district. When they see all that construction, it's tough for independent operators who maybe are putting their life savings into a new place to convince them that, you know, hey, weather this you know, next year of construction or two years, um, and then it's gonna be great. Um, so people have been kind of holding off. But once we sort of hit this tipping point, Hope Street and Grand, um, particularly between 11th and 12th, I think are gonna you know, really be um, sort of clusters that are gonna expand and really hit a critical mass. I wanna point out in particular, Mac Urban. Um, we're really lucky to have them as a major develop developer in the district. Their Avon project on Grand, which I've been working with their uh, real retail consultants and their brokers, um, and I think that's going to be a really key key um, point. The, some of the people that they're talking to, I think, are going to be great for the, the neighborhood um, when they finally lease it out. And I think once that happens in G12, it's really going to sort of be um, the neighborhood hub and kind of a catalyst for the rest of the retail. Okay, so this map, um, again, is small, and I, it's not, not a um, you know, detailed map. I really threw it together because I wanted to go through I want to go through some of you know where things are and um, specific stores where I can, um, and I thought it might be easier if just you have some visual reference. Um, the blue dots are basically existing, so all the colored dots are existing retail space. 
in the center of the district. They didn't go over, you know, bike big and LA live, but um, the blue ones are things that are currently leased, um, and the red ones are existing buildings that aren't leased. A couple of just broad things. So the things that aren't leased, a couple of these are buildings that literally just completed. So like Axis at 11, um, Onyx down here. Most of these other red dots um, are old warehouse buildings, which kind of gets into another dynamic that has made things a little bit challenging over the last couple of years is that a lot of those buildings, so probably like 7,000 square feet, um, which is a big space for um, for most retail places. Usually it's owned by an owner um, that it needs a lot of PIs. The owner usually isn't willing to put in very much PIs. If it's a, a restaurant, so I've gotten significant interest in different restaurants that want to open here, operators that have other restaurants. But usually what happens is they say, you know, hey, I opened my first restaurant and I had to go through building out a kitchen. I had to get the um, conditional use permit. It was such a long, expensive process. I don't want to go through that again. I want a second generation space. And the problem is we haven't really had much of that. Um, for a lot of that time, we haven't had any second generation space. At various times, we've had you know maybe one or two um, before it fills up. Um, and so some of those warehouse spaces have just been difficult to fill because it's been a mismatch between um, either the, the space uh, size or you know, you have people that are interested in building restaurants, but they just don't want to go through the risk and, and the money of building those out, and the owner hasn't been willing to do that. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of start at the top here and go through um, what we know. Caveat at the beginning, I know everybody wants details on, you know, stuff that is close to being leased, and I really can't do that because um, I have to be trustworthy, and when people give me information, they expect that I will keep my mouth shut and not share it. Um, and if I don't do that, nobody will give me information and then I'm much less effective. So what I'm gonna try to do in some of those situations is just give you a sense of where momentum is, where I can try to give you an idea of the types of retail that um, people are negotiating about or kind of in the works. Um, but I apologize, I know. I wish I could share more, but I just can't. So I'll start up here by 11. Um, this is 11th and Olive. Um, basically all these um, retail spaces around here are, are leased. You have the existing Starbucks, got a Verizon store moving in, Pizza Fire um, will be on Olympic here, Genwa Korean Barbecue, really good Korean barbecue place will be this corner space. You have the existing Healthy Spot, um, uh, real estate um, office is down here. Jump down to 1050, 1050 is fully leased. We've got a dentist office that will be opening up uh, this fall and a small space on Grand. The big corner space is gonna be a Chase Bank. We've got a real estate office that'll be on the 11th space here. Haven. All I'll say about Haven is that I'm really excited uh, in working with their team. They, um, there's a number of different types of retail that I've been working on trying to get in this district for basically since I've been at the bid. Um, and I think they're really going after the right types of tenants. Um, and there's a couple that I'm really excited about and I'm hopeful that they finalize stuff. So um, I can't really say more than that, um, but uh, I'm really excited about what they're working on there. Same thing with this G12 space um, at the corner of Grand and, and 12th. They were really close to, to signing a tenant there. Again, it's the type of retail that I've been working on for three years basically to get down here. And, and if that happens, I think um, it's gonna be really exciting. And I think the residents around there are really gonna like Key thing, so a lot of people ask about this, um, the Evo space here that's been empty um, since that building was completed. This is another dynamic that it, uh, relates to a couple of the, the spaces in our district, and that's spaces that look like they're vacant and are trying to be leased, but they really aren't. So that is owned by a real, um, a real estate investor who basically has decided that he's gonna wait until more of these projects are completed and retail's filled in and he's decided that he's gonna get a better lease rate you know, once that stuff is done and that that makes more financial sense for him. So he's not gonna lease that you know, within the next year or two. And I'm getting the like <laughs> speed up. <laughs> so I just wanna say that because there's been a lot of people interested in that space. We've had a number of different retailers that would like to go there, um, but it's just the guy's holding out for a really high number and he's, he's not gonna lease it until um, more stuff is done. Um, key point I also wanna make the Pico Corridor um, is about to really change drastically. We've got um, Starbucks down there, uh, Green Dry Cleaners, um, which please use if you're not aware of it. Robas is gonna be opening up. We've got Macchiato Cafe will be opening up. 
first draft is going to be opening up um, within the next couple of weeks. Um, dog daycare is going to be opening up hopefully next couple of weeks. Um, also want to point out High Def Brewing um, is working on sort of the north end of that block um, by 12th and Olive, uh, another brewery in the district. So with that first draft, um, that's really going to kind of change that area. Um, and then just in brief, so I think you guys have seen um, you know, at least the top two of these before, or the top three of these. My top three priorities, you know, really since I've been here, grocery, pharmacy, healthy, fast, casual. Um, grocery, um, we're getting more momentum on that now. Um, there, so there is a, a gourmet market that's close to signing a lease in the center part of the district. Um, I think it's going to be a really good fit. Hopeful that the, that gets finalized. Same thing with the pharmacy. There's an independent pharmacy um, that's looking at space center part of the district. I think that would be a perfect fit as opposed to like a Walgreens or CVS. Um, and healthy, fast, casual food. We've gotten a lot more momentum um, on that. Um, there's a couple that are looking at different spaces, um, some specific brands that, that I think would be really good fits. And I think once we get to that Q3 of next year um, and there's more people on the streets, um, that's where um, we're going to see more momentum there. Last things, uh, people always ask me about Oceanwide and Circa. Um, they have crazy NDAs on those, so even the brokers won't really tell me a lot of information. What I know is Oceanwide has six restaurants um, signed already. Sort of a mix of things, at least one is a steakhouse. Circa um, has, is close to signing with two restaurant groups. Again, one of them is a steakhouse. They've got a bank for a little bit of a corner here right on Figueroa. They've gotten offers on um, the space facing Flower, but they've been more focused on the front, wrapping up those front spaces um, to begin with. Um, I think that's it. Is that good? <laughs> good question. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give us any color on the, um, the ASU rumor or <clears throat> what, yeah. what's... I can jump in on that one. Um, Great. Why don't you jump in? Yeah. So, uh, Harold Examiner, Georgetown, who owns the property, um, was very tight lipped about that, did not tell anybody who that tenant was going to be. I had a call with um, the COO of Georgetown yesterday, and he's making an introduction with uh, some folks over at ASU and Vihaya who are going to be developing that space and um, programming it. So we have absolutely no idea if it's going to be students who are there, administrative, if it's you know graduate programs, what it is. Um, but we're really excited to have a you know it's entire education. It's fantastic. Um, it's and the whole building. <clears throat> the ground floor is going to be a restaurant. Well, no, I understand. But that, but the rest, yep, yeah, the entire space is going to be them, which wow. is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're we're really excited to kind of collaborate with them and you know obviously integrate them into the district and into downtown community. Um, and so that will be happening over the next couple of weeks. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, we got to keep it moving. Yes, we can make this deck available absolutely. Oh, quick too. Uh, I just updated the Wise South Park deck, which if people don't know, okay. has like a whole bunch of development information and stats and maps that I've tried to present in a very easy to understand way. It's very helpful. The whole point of doing it is to make sure that people that are trying to bring tenants into the district, develop in the district, invest, whatever, like have numbers that they can easily use. I have some printed out copies. It's going to be on our website. Please use it. It's really valuable. I spent a significant amount of time doing it. And the whole point is for all of you just to take it and use it however it's helpful to you. Um, so I'll leave them here. Please. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Um, next up, we have an update from our homeless outreach coordinator, um, Angela. Um, so Angela's been working in the district um, for about five months now. And so we thought it was a good time for her to give an overview of the work that she's been doing and sort of what lies ahead. Um, Angela, well, do what you got to do. This is really important. <laughs> okay, I can't see. I don't know if I'm going to make Okay, thank you. Okay, so back in April when I presented, I talked about the process of taking someone from the streets um, and into permanent housing and additionally receiving supportive services. So I just wanted to remind you guys of what the process is. Just leave that in the corner. I'm sorry, I didn't bring my glasses. Um, <laughs> so, so enrolling, well, uh, engaging the individuals, assessing them using the PDF, and enrolling them into the 
homeless management information system is the first step. Connecting them to client, connecting them to um, how I'm sorry, housing related services is um, is crucial because if a person has like a mental illness or has a physical disability or things like that, they need to be connected to the appropriate agency. Um, obtaining all the necessary documentation, so everybody has to have an ID to um, to get into shelter or to the program. Everybody has to have a social security card. If they're getting into housing, they have to have proof of income. So obtaining these documents are necessary. And then um, once everything is in place, then I will submit the, the match to the CES matcher. So um, I noticed while I've been working that some of these are, I've been having challenges with because as an independent contractor, I'm not my own organization and not my own nonprofit. So I don't have access to like the reduced fee or the no fee ID voucher like I did in the past. So there's been a few things that I've been struggling with getting the, um, the birth certificate waivers and things like that. So here is where I'm trying to rely on other agencies in order to meet that. Um, I have had some help with like the people concerned a couple of different places, but I feel like there's a lot of other agencies that can step up and be a lot more supportive. So some of the demographics that I found out um, during the last five months, the South Park um, State team does a homeless count. I've also done um, counts in addition. And between those um, numbers, there's an average of 18 people living on the streets. 79% uh, are male, 21% are female, and 100% are chronically homeless. Meaning they've been homeless for a year or more and have a disabling condition or they've had uh, four episodes of homelessness over the past few years. So the impact to date, um, so far I've been able to link two individuals um, to income. Um, two individuals have improved their physical health, meaning they've got Medi-Cal. Um, so they're able to connect to a primary care provider and receive like health care, regular health care now. And I'm sorry, let me go back to the income, meaning I've taken them to the Department of Social Services and they were able to apply for a general release and, and get benefits. Um, two have improved their diet um, by connecting to the Department of Social Services and, and getting on the CalFresh program, formerly known as the Food Stamp program. And also um, for homeless individuals, they um, offered the Hot Fresh Hot Meal program. So there's a lot of restaurants in the area that will accept the electronic benefits card, the EBC card, and they're able to go to um, like Puerto Loco, Subway. So I kind of developed a little bit so they know where they can get the hot food. Um, and one individual is matched to housing. So there's still one more, um, the, the building interviews that we have to go through, but they found a fit for, for one of the clients. So, at the beginning, um, just based on what I saw in April, I kind of anticipated these outcomes, and so far, um, this is what the numbers are. So I anticipated meeting 18 people just based on, on the homeless count. Um, I have engaged 28 different people. These are unduplicated encounters. Um, basically, uh, there's a matrix at the end that kind of tells you what each of these, uh, definition for each of these measures are. So basically this is just something like water, it might be um, a hygiene kit or a feature or something like that. Um, we anticipated 36 and I've given out 44 items. Public benefits, that's like Department of Social Services, um, legal services, things like that. Um, anticipated nine and um, eight were connected. Uh, supportive services, that's anything like transportation, the reduced fee vouchers, um, the, the uh, homeless certification, things like that, uh, anticipated 36 and have done 18. Um, the CES is the coordinated entry system, so that survey um, anticipated nine and completed six. For the housing applications, we anticipated five being completed and three have been completed so far. Crisis of bridge housing, um, anticipated three, it was zero, but when this was created, uh, just uh, the day before yesterday, I did transport someone to um, a crisis bridge housing. He's my first person to actually accept um, like a shelter or interim housing, so that will be changed to one. And then permanent housing, I have not met yet. So I anticipate these people hopefully 
by the end of the year. Um, that's the matrix. I think we can probably say that. Really yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay. And then, um, so some of the challenges, um, the clients, they're they're very transient. I mean, I can I try to arrange places like see here. They don't have they don't have watches. They don't have calls. They don't have a concept of the day of the week sometimes. So it's really hard to see me here on Tuesday. Um, the safe team has really really helped me out a lot by you know saying hey I found you know so and so and um, so I've been able to like kind of reach them that way. Um, and just having large bulky items, they don't want to leave them behind. I'm like we have an appointment. We have to go. But who, you know, I'm gonna go with my stuff, and they're scared of losing because all they have. So um, it's that's been challenging. It's trying to find somewhere that will store this. There isn't the bins in um, uh, Skid Row, but it's really far to push all these things, and um, it's a lot. It's, it's gonna be more than what they can accommodate. Um, starting from scratch. So pretty much everyone that I've encountered has absolutely nothing. They don't have an ID. They don't have mail with their name on it. It's been several years since they've had anything. So just establishing identity for everyone has been a huge challenge. Uh, mental and physical disabilities. Um, there are people that say, hey, yeah, I think that I, I need a mental evaluation. There are people that know they have a history of um, PTSD or certain things and they've lost their benefits and they don't know how to restart and get reconnected. So that's been an issue. Um, some admit to using substance or alcohol. Um, some don't want to stop and some want to uh, pursue treatment. Um, no income or a steady source of income. So there's some people that recycle, but it's not steady, it's paid um, And then there's people that actually have a job, but the cost of living exceeds their income. So they get off of work and they go around the block and sleep there. So next steps um, are um, improving collaboration with the city and county um, service providers in the area and um, identifying volunteers. So I did meet with United Way and um, there's someone that I know from that's working there now that said that we, maybe I can attach to a larger organization that's already has a nonprofit um, uh, ID number and all of that. And maybe the interns from like USC or somewhere that are doing social work can um, go through them and I can just kind of supervise them when they're out doing their work. So, um, I did that at my other job, I was able to sign up as a successor, but now it's just me, I'm not sure what legally I can do. So, looking into having another person come out and outreach with me. Um, identifying more, just more client resources, and that's just, there's tons more that I feel like I need to have. Um, one great update is they did launch the LA Hop, which is a Los Angeles homeless outreach portal. And um, there is a link, but also in the handout, there is um, a hyperlink that you can click on. And um, so you'd be able to log on to here and um, you can actually do a referral yourself. So if, you can, if you see someone that you've, you've seen more than like a few times and you feel like um, no one has come by to outreach, um, you can actually put all that information and they will send a team to um, engage that individual. And it does, there is a lot of like, um, you know, it could take three days, it could do it in the but um, nonetheless, I recommend that you guys just get familiar with it. Just, you know, just look at it and give it a shot. Um, I think that was it. Thanks, Angela. So this is five months of, of work. Um, and we, you know, we made the decision to start uh, funding this program um, and this position. Uh, we knew it was gonna be a challenge, for sure. Um, and it's going to take time. Uh, so, you know, we appreciate the update. I feel good about the work that's being done out in the field. Um, I think even though we did walk into it knowing it was going to be an uphill battle and sort of a, a challenging task, it's hard not to feel a little discouraged. Um, but Angela reminded me every day that like, this, is, this is how this works. You know, these folks have been living on the street for years and years, and so it's going to take way more than um, to to get them to a point where they want to, uh, you know, seek permanent housing. Uh, yeah, well, it's been, I want to make that decision at the six-month mark. Um, it would mean an 
do we more funding for us? Um, and you know, we, we have some internal, uh, we have some other avenues that I think are worth exploring sure. before we do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, next up is Wallace. Wallace, yes. do the other. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do real quick. I'm sorry, I lost track of the agenda. I'm Bob. Ahead. Bob. <coughs> Okay, the um, uh, financial report uh, is very predictable. The, the thing that I, again, that I watch most carefully is the uh, expenses, and uh, as of July 31, we're running uh, negative 7.2%. Um, so we're um, managing our costs very well. Uh, another thing I want to bring up is Alan and I and Marcus at our CPA firm, Armadino, are going to change our budgeting process. We're going to start creating a 18 month look at going forward budgets that are updated every six months. Uh, we're going to do this um, hopefully. Do we have set dates? Yeah, on the 5th. Yeah, we're going to get with Marcus on the 5th to start setting up. Um, exactly how we're going to do this. I think Alan's working on a template. I know Marcus is going to help us with this. And ideally, by November 1, we'll be able to throw it out the short. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Secretary of State, Channing. We're um, going to have board elections upcoming, and um, there will be an online uh, application process. All of this will go live on September 4th. Um, and then, nomination periods for 30 days following that, and applications to be submitted by October 18th. And we'll then do the elections on November 1st, or no. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so the, the criteria for that is all gonna be online. Um, it's a little lengthy. Basically, it's um, a representative of a property owner or a property owner themselves. Uh, board members or anybody can nominate someone um, to apply and then applications will be sent to nominees. Nominees will have a month to submit. Okay, uh, very good. So we are gonna skip 10A, there's not an update there. 10B, um, Terry, unless you wanna add anything, I'm gonna kick it over to Wallace so she can run through her wayfinding. This is a really exciting project. All right. So a lot of you know a lot of the background here, so I'm gonna to try to be pretty brief with it. Uh, we've been working on a wayfinding project. You're probably familiar with signs like this one on the top um, that are posted very high in downtown. They're really oriented for vehicular travel um, and they're not pedestrian friendly at all. Uh, downtown as a whole, the business improvement districts and the Central City Association have all identified for a long time wayfinding as a priority. Uh, but doing it like this one that you see on the bottom is incredibly expensive and it takes a long time. And then it's even more expensive and challenging to make a system that's dynamic with all the changes happening in South Park. Uh, traditional maps that you aren't able to reprint are uh, not that useful for that long and systems like they have in other cities uh, that are interactive are incredibly expensive. So we were looking for a way to do this um, to kind of tide us over as there's extreme growth and um, until the city really is able to prioritize this. So our three most important things in our approach were that we wanted it to be pedestrian focused. We wanted it to be lighter, quicker, and cheaper. So uh, easier to implement, faster to implement, and cost less. And we wanted to utilize existing infrastructure. And so we identified uh, 22 originally, 21 originally, and it's moved up to 23 utility boxes um, that we want to wrap. So the red ones are the utility boxes we've chosen to create uh, vinyl wraps for that can depict some of the wayfinding infrastructure. Uh, they're along pedestrian corridors and near major landmarks. And our cost breakdowns here, uh, we're working with Rios Clemente Hale Studios on design. They've been unbelievably fabulous. Um, CRNA Custom, Colin here is our rep, and he has been amazing. Um, and we originally went out hoping to raise $15,049. We exceeded that, which is what allowed us to add those boxes and is allowing us to have a little bit more freedom in the design. Um, and I'm going to quickly go through our sponsors, and then I'm going to show you the final concepts. So, Barcito, Be Organic, California Hospital, Council District 14, the Grammy Museum, 
Jade Enterprises, LA Live, Los Angeles Convention Center, Mac Real Estate, The Proper Hotel, and the YWCA all are pitching in to help us make this happen. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank uh, Terry Tonis for being a fabulous District Identity Committee Chair, um, Terry Rubenwright, Andrea Borgen, and Colin Dove for showing up to all of our District Identity meetings and being really quick with your feedback. I appreciate that so much. Um, Lulu, do you mind flipping to the other one? It's the last one. So, um, try to continue my excitement. Um, we, uh, we went with um, a urban backyard theme for these boxes. So we were trying to play in the design off of the name South Park, off of our branding, off of that dark green that we know and love so well. Um, and then Rios Clemente is also designing South Grand Park at the Avon Project. So they've done a lot of research into um, like green space in South Park already, and it felt like a really natural fit. We adopted a California inclusive plant selection. So these are all either California native or things you see commonly. <laughs> I won't get into the weeds, um, but it's really exciting. Um, and we wanted to bring some color in using some of those uh, plants that aren't necessarily uh, native. Uh, so this is an unfolded layout of what these are going to look like. We have two maps, and you'll see on one side there's a zoomed in version of South Park, so you'll be able to see what's in the immediate area around you. Um, metro lines will have icons indicating small businesses. Uh, these middle panels are going to have um, larger directionals, so you can see that you're close to the metro station, you can see that you're close to LA Live. All of these first three panels will change depending on which box you're looking at so that they're relevant to the immediate area. And then we're also doing a zoomed out view of downtown uh, to give people an idea of where they are within the larger community. Um, we talk a lot about how we're actually much closer to the rest of downtown than people think we are. So we really want to encourage that kind of exploration. Um, and then you'll see underneath the South Park map uh, all of these little areas where all our sponsor logos are going to be. So a few more visions of what this is going to look like. I promise we'll capitalize color life correctly when we print these. Um, and the kind of plants that we're using. So I'm incredibly excited. We now have a two week period where Rios Clemente will be fabricating all of the uh, individual boxes. So uh, now that we have this concept finalized, they're going in and figuring out exactly what goes on each of those maps um, and tailoring it to each of the individual box locations, which they've already walked and taken like a survey of. And so uh, we have a two week process there. Conservatively, I'm hoping you know, we just had a few days. I'm hoping that that means we'll be able to send to Colin to print um, by September 10th at the latest. So, um, okay, well, um, yeah. On the, on the map, you had some red dots and some green dots. What's the difference? Oh, the green dots are just the, oh, and the other map, they're just the original, all of the utility boxes that we could wrap. So, um, we first went out and Victor's team identified every single one that fits the template that we have, and then we chose from those. So that so does mean that if we... Is the initial rollout. Uh, yeah, and so if we, if this is successful and we do feel like we want to expand it to the rest of the utility boxes, I think that there's another 11 that we could wrap within the district um, that meet our existing template. And that's a template CRNA has printed before, too, so... And the, the lifespan of these wraps are like two to three years, so yeah. um, it'll give us some time to kind of assess how these And because that um, zoomed in map is going to be the most detailed one, if we do reprint and expand, we can possibly save some money by not having to reprint everything. Are, are we protecting them from graffiti and? Yeah, uh, we're we're being with CD14 yeah. to their yes. <laughs> they have a graffiti <laughs> abatement program where they're Actually, able to yeah. <laughs> we have a graffiti coding we put on prints as well, so I would say it helps spray paint any mark. Uh, we got two graffiti options. Right. So, um, and Victor's already tested out cleaning some of these to see what we need to be worried about. So this project is great for a number of reasons. One, it helps us with branding of the district, um, providing sort of this cohesive um, experience of what South Park is and differentiates us from the rest, from some of the other districts in downtown. Um, and then also, you know, uh, it's useful. So we're really excited. We are very appreciative of everybody's input. Um, this really has been a, 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 a joint effort here. So thanks so much. And keep you updated on the rollout. Yeah, really um, excited. Alex um, has taken this on um, and has done such a fantastic job. So thank you.
Anything else you want to add, Wallace? Uh, really quickly, parking day. Yes. Um, so on to my, my point two. Um, we have coming up uh, on September 21st is parking day. At our last board meeting, we were exploring the idea of combining parking day with a block party. Um, we have decided to do a block party separately and not try to combine a whole bunch of things that are different. Uh, so we are planning our own parking day activation. We'll be taking over one or two parking spots uh, on Grand, just south of Olympic, uh, for the day and building a little park there. So it's going to be, you can expect some seating, some shade, uh, a lemonade stand type vibe, um, and we're really excited about it. So mark that on your calendars and plan on attending. If you would like to do your own activation, um, we do have a deck that went out in our newsletter um, that you can use to uh, kind of begin the process of creating your own parking day, parking spot, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that too. I think that's it. Okay. Uh, any, uh, sorry, this is any um, update on the location for the September 15th breakfast uh, back to school? No, we're still working on a location. Um, well, you know. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I'll get to that. Uh, All right, well, thank you. So I have a few updates as well. Um, we had an open house, so we are we went out to bid for uh, our clean and safe services. It's the first time that we have done this in quite some years, so this is a healthy, normal, good thing to do. Um, we received uh, replies from everyone that we shared the RFP with. That was eight companies: uh, Allied, Andrew, Street Class, Block by Block, Chrysalis, Conservation Corps, City Garden, and ABM. Uh, we had an open house yesterday morning and seven of those companies showed up. Um, applications are due, or proposals are due, on October 2nd. So staff will have um, about a month before a board meeting to review. I'll be making recommendations. Um, anybody who wants to be involved in the review of those proposals is certainly welcome to. Um, I'm gonna be working very quickly with Bob. He is our chair on all things being safe. So um, we have a pretty good idea of what we are looking for, and I'm really excited to see what these companies come back with in terms of proposals. So, so stay tuned for that. And um, as a reminder, please do make sure that you plan on being at the November 1st board meeting. There's going to be a lot of action items on that board meeting, and voting on um, clean and safe vendors is going to be one of them. So mark the calendar. Um, we had our first working group on capturing the value of development. I mentioned this at our last board meeting. Board members were all invited to attend that. We had um, a few folks turn out for that. Jim Pugh, who was unable to make this meeting, uh, is sort of chairing that ad hoc committee. I think it was a really good first step and gave us a framework. I'm gonna be sending out a memo to board members as an update, um, but we will be scheduling a follow-up call and figuring out how we want to include some of our developer uh, community in the next steps. Essentially, uh, what we our first step is identifying and prioritizing the projects that we do want to see happen in the district, and and um, strategizing how to integrate into existing systems through CD14, through city planning, community plan update, um, to build those into the development project uh, process much earlier on than we have initially. Um, lastly, office move update. Uh, I am expecting to receive a first draft of a lease um, at 1115 in South Hope, uh, and that should be coming either today or tomorrow. Um, Jim Pugh, who is our resident legal counsel uh, on the board, will be, um, I'll be working with him to make sure that everything looks okay on that lease, and hopefully we'll have something signed by the end of the month. So that's really exciting. Um, we are, uh, Jade has been very gracious in allowing me to work with their architect. Um, so we're going through the permitting process through through uh, Chip, the architect. And um, the plans look fantastic. Hopefully the build out won't take more than about eight weeks. Um, so we are on track to um, move in you know, by the end of the year. Yes, so the, you know, why this was such a big deal to move is that we wanted to um, co-office the with our team. So that would, that would be happening, which is really good news. And is that the right contractor? 
Uh, yeah, so we have four GCs um, that are going to that are in the process of submitting proposals. Um, all of these folks have been pre-vetted, so I know that what they're about to submit is something that isn't going to scare me, um, which is great because the first round was like, oh wow, this is all over the board. Our um, <laughs> our plans are more firm now. Um, our, we have construction docs, so they, you know, their bids are coming in. Um, we'll be making that final decision in the next What kind of um, signage will we have for the new office? Uh, we have not yet determined what that's going to be. I think we should think about that. Yeah. The, the owner has been doing a lot of work on the building, which is great. That was sort of uh, part of the deal. Was, you know, well, we interest. should have a placeholder in the budget for that. Yes. And we should be thinking about you know, Yeah, outdoor signage. It's ground floor. So. Yeah, maybe we just take down those. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but that is on our Good. on yeah a line item on the budget. Okay. Of the, of the um, okay. So a couple of upcoming um, events. Please mark your calendar. We have a district identity committee meeting on the twelfth, September twelfth. National Parking Day, as well as mentioned, is the twenty first. Rich brought up. Um, and it's not on here, it's, it hasn't finalized it, I don't think, but we have a back to school reading list, which we're really excited about. Um, this kind of goes towards, uh, you know, meeting your neighbors, getting to know the neighborhood, um, and really facilitating meaningful conversation across stakeholders. So we've sent out, we've selected um, a series of articles uh, about the usage of public space and how it contributes to a number of different life factors like like that. So uh, it was in our newsletter, but we're probably going to do another e blast at some point. So we would love to actually Virginia and talk to you. I hope you can be there because it's not a conversation to have with you. Uh, and we'll figure out details in terms of location and everything. Team up to clean up is the 22nd. Um, council office is, is spearheading that. We will be sending out details as we get them. Um, we're hosting a walk shop as part of the National Association of City Transit Officials on, there's two of them, uh, the second and the third, and then our infrastructure planning committee next meeting is October 3rd. Annual meeting date just got locked down. I sent board members an invitation, that's December 6th, but our next full board meeting with all of these votes will be on November 1st. Location to you. Thank you so much. Sorry, we're five minutes over. Uh, meetings adjourned at 10.05. All right.